This video is sponsored by NordPass, a password management service provided by NordVPN. NordPass uses top of field encryption to securely save, store, and protect your passwords, and even generate new and complex passwords with just the click of a button. You simply download the extension to your internet browser and select one master password to log into any and all of your accounts. NordPass is compatible with just about every major internet browser, as well as your iPhone and Android devices. When you use the NordPass browser extension or app, you are not only securing your personal account information, but you're also making your life easier in general by only needing to remember one password instead of constantly clicking that dreaded forgot password link every other day. If you click on the link down below, you can receive 50% off of the already very low monthly price, all the while supporting my channel. You can do this by using the promo code from nothing or simply going to nordpass.com slash from nothing. So anyway, without further ado, let's continue on with the video. Hello everybody, it's Jabara here. Among one of the most popular categories for the superiority of one civilization over another, hygiene almost always comes into context. Modern Eurocentrics will cite the relatively unclean nature of poor or rural African communities, with extra emphasis on things like flies on their skin or drinking water so dirty that it resembles the color of chocolate milk. On the flip side, Afrocentrics too cite unsanitary living conditions of European peoples throughout most of history highlighting the prevalence of major disease epidemics like the bubonic plague or the peculiar practice of using the streets below as a place to dump their excrement. In reality, hygiene is something that human beings regardless of color have an innate tendency to strive for. Even most animals do their very best to remain as clean as possible. Unfortunately, with our ever-changing societies and ever-growing populations, this is not always possible. While we know with great certainty that the sophisticated systems of aqueducts and public baths clearly demonstrate that Europe was not always as filthy of a place as it was throughout the Middle Ages, how exactly did Africa's conditions compare prior to the modern era? Let's discuss a few of them right now. Africa is the second largest major landmass on Earth and the second largest population. It is highly diverse in geographical and climatic diversity and as such, cultural diversity. With this diversity comes a wide plethora of hygiene practices that developed independently throughout the history of the continent, based on the very specific needs and conditions of each respective group. The Ovahempa, for example, are a people who live in a relatively arid region. Inhabiting parts of Angola and Namibia, they lead a semi-nomadic lifestyle, primarily herding cattle and living relatively sedentary lifestyles, so as long as there is sufficient rainfall for their crops. If they have a particularly dry season, they just move on to greener pastures. These are people who are often used as a clear demonstration to generalize all Africans as people who foolishly and pointlessly walk several miles per day just to gather water. In reality, this is only a problem faced by those who live in certain regions. In particular, very dry regions or very wet and tropical regions. In Africa, Insect-borne viruses, or more specifically malaria and the sleeping sickness, pose a great risk to those living right next to large bodies of fresh water, and prevents certain kinds of livestock such as horses altogether. On the other hand, in regions prone to arid conditions and unpredictable rainfall, walking several miles for water is just an unavoidable fact of life, and as such, among groups like the Ovahemba, bathing as we know it here is virtually non-existent. However, this isn't to say that hygiene is not important to them at all. This would be nothing short of misinformation. Over time and out of necessity, the Ovahemba have developed traditional methods of keeping clean without the need for copious amounts of water. They do this by igniting a mixture of herbs and incense in a bowl, allowing it to smolder. They then squat over the bowl and trap in the smoke with a blanket. The smoke emitted from this mixture of burning herbs has antimicrobial properties, as well as deodorizing aromas. In addition to these daily smoke baths, the Ovahemba partake in the harvesting of a natural resin which is secreted from the Omumbiri plant. This resin is said to have a scent that is pleasant beyond comparison. Since the plants that produce it only grow locally, the naturally secreted resin is the only thing harvested in order to maintain a renewable supply. It is then crushed and mixed with red ochre and fat. This mixture has a pleasant aroma and both moisturizes and protects the skin from the intense heat UV rays in dry conditions. The former Zulu Kingdom of Southeastern South Africa have long been aware of the intimate relationship that rested between water and sanitation. 
For example, lakes and rivers were considered unsuitable sources of drinking water and would only be used for washing and bathing. All drinking and cooking was done with water collected from natural springs and fountains. Hand washing was a practice strongly emphasized to anyone after they used the toilet. This was done in a large covered basin of water that was sat next to every door of every hut. Additionally, the water in this basin would be replaced daily. These hygienic practices were so prevalent among the Zulu people that they have no record of any waterborne illnesses in pre-colonial times, a far cry from the prevalence of them that plague many African communities today, as most have shifted to Western methods of water management, which are quite susceptible to waterborne parasites, especially in tropical climates and in economies with less efficient water treatment facilities. Originating in West Africa and local varieties prevailing throughout the continent, we have one of the most popular examples of an indigenous soap in all of history. African Black Soap Black soap is a commodity found throughout much of the continent that is even popular outside of the continent, as most beauty shops or department stores within the United States and Canada regularly include it within their inventories. Its namesake comes from its distinct black or brownish color, this color is caused by the charred mixture of indigenous African plants and herbs used in this preparation. Though the ingredients vary from region to region, plantain peels or cacao pods are usually the primary ingredient. These ashes are then mixed with water and various fats and oils such as palm oil and shea butter before being left to cure for two weeks. For centuries, various indigenous groups of West Africa, notably around modern day Ghana, have been producing this product which hosts a plethora of health and hygienic benefits. Among these include highly antimicrobial properties with the ability to inhibit the growth of diseases such as that of E. coli and staph infections, among several others, and even today can be recommended as a medicated soap for treatment of skin diseases. Additionally, the charcoal clears pores and treats acne, while the palm oil and shea butter serve to moisturize the skin. Moving to other regions of West Africa, we find perhaps one of the most efficient methods of obtaining pure, clean drinking water in historical times and arguably present times. Several groups throughout West Africa employed an indigenous system of impluvium to obtain fresh water for the purposes of bathing, washing, drinking, and even indoor cooling. The word impluvium itself comes from a similar system used by the ancient Romans. These groups in Africa include the Jola in Senegal and the Aruba and Edo peoples of Nigeria. A common theme found among the architecture of these peoples was the presence of courtyard-based home or family compounds. Here in the West, most of our homes are built on a plot of land surrounded by a yard. Courtyard-based compounds, on the other hand, are the other way around, with the house being built around the yard on the inside, which was used as a private area for families to congregate for activities such as bathing, cooking, washing, and spiritual or religious gatherings. Among the Jola peoples, these homes usually took a circular form and not like that of a mud hut, but more similar to that of a ring or tire. The roof would slope down into the circular courtyard in which the censer had a collection basin or several large pots for water. In some cases, fruit trees would be planted there as well. This was especially efficient in the rainforest regions of West Africa where water was plentiful and eliminated the need to rely on rivers, lakes, streams, or wells that would often be contaminated with harmful parasites and diseases such as malaria. Yoruba and Edo compounds, however, took on a more rectangular form. Higher status individuals would sometimes have courtyards paved in complex patterns with a unique form of potsherd pavement. They would also often feature several courtyards rather than just one. The complexity of Yoruba and Edo courtyards, however, is something that would warrant its own video or frankly several videos. So with that, we'll end this video here by me stating an opinion I have after all of my research. Frankly, we could learn a lot from these impluvium based structures. There's no reason why so many parts of this region of Africa should be struggling to find clean sources of water when our ancestors had it figured out centuries ago. We should not be looking for western methods of solving these problems but instead, Look to what our ancestors had already figured out and what has worked throughout history. In fact, the modern day country of Bermuda incorporates a similar system. All buildings in Bermuda are self-sustaining featuring stepped rooftops to slow down the fall of rain and collect it into gutters which then flow into underground collection tanks. These types of rooftops are mandated by law due to the lack of freshwater lakes or rivers on these islands. The same can be done not just in Africa but elsewhere in the world, especially in places that receive heavy rainfall. We constantly overexploit our natural water supplies, 
So much so that we've resorted to recycling our own sewage for drinking water. I'm sure that most of us could agree that clean, fresh water from the sky and no water bills is a much better system. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video and learned something new because I definitely did, and let me know what you think of these indigenous methods of bathing. Also, if you'd like to discuss this video or pretty much anything else history related, you can join the Empire From Nothing, a community of history nerds like me who chat about these things 24-7. Also, if you'd like free access to the sources used in this video and other videos, you can find them on fromnothing.info slash sources or my Patreon account. Both of these will be linked below. See you next time, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.